Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on entrance screening. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Emily Whitcomb. I'm a director here at the National Safety Council. Uh, I normally work on our Work to Zero initiative, but I've been helping out with SAFER on the webinars and the subgroups. And I'm really excited to bring to you this quick hit webinar series. These 30 minute webinars are designed to share the SAFER quick hits and give you a short case study from one of our task force members. Uh, we're really excited to be joined today by Jason Wernick from Ameren. Uh, he is going to share uh, their entrance screening procedures. Uh, since this is a short webinar today, these 30 minute webinars, we did not build in time for verbal, verbal Q&A, uh, but if you are able to type questions into the Q&A box. Um, as well as the chat box. We have some NSC SAFER staff that will uh, respond to questions as we are able, and Jason has volunteered to respond to questions um, has, as he is able as well. So feel free to type your questions in there, um, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. Uh, just to let you know, all of these slides and the recordings from this entire webinar series are going to be available for you. Um, as soon as we're finished, we're going to work on packaging all that up and getting it onto the website, nsc.org forward slash safer. Uh, it may be later today or early Monday that you can go on and check those out. So before we get started, I want to give a quick thank you to our sponsors, Aveta, ISN, McElhatton Foundation, and U.S. Steel. Thank you for your generous support of the SAFER effort. So let's look at our agenda today for this 30 minute webinar. I'm going to start us out by looking at some background uh, on what SAFER has been up to, uh, the framework that we built, the playbook that we pushed out. I'm going to walk you through the quick hit um, item that is the subject of this webinar today, which is entrance screening protocols. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jason to share with you uh, what Amarin is doing in this regard. Uh, and then I will close this out with some uh, additional resources. I'm going to walk you through the website a little bit. There's a ton of resources on the website. I want to make sure that you are all aware of the resources and how to navigate that. So let's start uh, by doing a little background where the SAFER initiative started. Uh, you know, the first thing that SAFER did was develop a task force. These are um, EHS experts. Um, and we put together a framework document of all the recommendations that um, employers should be looking at in regards to COVID risk mitigation. So we looked across six topic areas, uh, physical health, medical health, stress, emotional, and mental health, employment, legal, and HR, communication, and external factors. We also looked across four different operations types, office, closed industrial, open industrial, and public. So this is our framework. Uh, we actually, I want to show you an example of a playbook document. We decided to dig a little bit deeper into uh, these various uh, topic areas, the six topic areas, the four operations types. So Morgan, if you want to flip to our next slide, I'll show you an example of the office operations uh, playbook. So the overarching framework had something like 200 recommendations, and these were mostly a laundry list organized by those topic areas. Uh, but we wanted to uh, make them a little bit easier to engage with, so it's not just so overwhelming for our employers. Um, so we pulled out the different uh, operations types and the topic areas, and then we took a little bit of deeper dive. We tossed them back to our task force and asked them, you know, for this one, in regards to the office operations specifically, what are all of the key items that employers should be thinking about? So if you haven't seen the larger framework document, or these playbooks, check them out. There are 10 of them um, up on the website at safer at NSC, I'm sorry, nsc.org forward slash safer. So in this webinar series, uh, we are gonna be talking about um, one of our nine quick hit items. All of these quick hit items came out of our um, task force, and we wanted to um, do a webinar series to walk you through the items and show you how a task force member has been working um, in this regard. So today's quick hit item um, is in regards to entrance screening, um, and this provides recommend, recommended guidance uh, relative to the screening of all workers before entry into the workplace during the period in which COVID-19 protocols are in place. 
So this document, I believe it's uh, three or four pages. Morgan, if you want to flip it to the next page and we can look at that larger uh, document. There's a few sections here for your consideration. Uh, the first section is screening preparation. How to identify your screeners, ensuring the screeners are properly trained, what supplies you'll need, um, how to track uh, failed screenings. Then we have protocol for screeners, um, some uh, risk mitigation tactics in there. Uh, the next section is at-home screening questions. So many of you probably have had to do an at-home screening at some point, uh, asking if you've had a fever, if you've had a cough, shortness of breath, um, uh, all the list of those um, COVID-19 symptoms there. Uh, the next section is in regard to on-site screening questions. Um, so we have questions that the employee should be asking themselves before they come to the work site, and then questions that uh, you should be asking as part of your entrance screening protocol on site. Um, I believe the next slide, Morgan, if you want to flip it, we had a task force member who donated a really great uh, flow chart for how they are doing their entrance screening protocol. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the slides with the flow chart, um, this is a really great resource that was donated to us. So thank you to that task force member. Uh, the final um, section on here, which uh, I don't have a visual for, but is what to do if you have a failed screening protocol. Uh, so this entrance screening protocol uh, is available on the website. Uh, it's up there for free. If you have not had a chance to check it out, um, please do. And Maria, if you want to flip us to the next slide. I want to introduce our guest speaker to, for today, uh, Jason Wernex. He's the Senior Director of Safety and Health with Amarin. He's going to talk to us a bit about how Amarin is doing entrance screening. Uh, so I'm going to read his bio real quick before I hand it over to him. Jason Wernex, Senior Director of Safety and Health, is a certified safety professional who leads a team of professionals in the corporate safety and health organization for Amarin, a Fortune 500 electric and gas utility based in St. Louis, Missouri. Jason and his team are responsible for the development and execution of safety strategies that mitigate risk, as well as providing consultation and governance for business sector segment uh, partners throughout Amarin. Jason and his team have been heavily involved in the COVID-19 pandemic planning and response for Amarin. So Jason, thank you for being on today. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Emily. Um, just wanted to start off by saying thank you to, uh, to the whole SAFER group and everybody that's contributed to, uh, to all the materials that, you know, that we're using to safely return coworkers back to, uh, back to their facilities and, uh, uh, do so in a in a safe manner to mitigate risk and and uh, really help to manage the uh, the whole COVID nineteen pandemic. So, so thank you to uh, to everyone that's contributed to that. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I just want to share a little bit of information about about Amarin um, uh, from a health screening perspective. What we're doing. Um, I think if you could just go ahead to the next slide. I think one of the things that um, I really wanted to stress here is I'm just. I'm just focusing today on the, the health screening processes, and as I'm sure that most everybody on the phone is aware, you know, the whole um, the whole key to, to COVID uh, uh, management, if you will, is it's not there's not a silver bullet. It's really a, it's about taking precautions in several different areas. So I'm going to be drilling into the health screening process, but the health screening process is really just one of many um, um, strategies that we're using at AMR to try to um, you know, keep our workers safe. And I, I've listed a few of the others, at least the big hitters um, under that. The, uh, of course, avoiding crowds, wearing face covering, social distancing, and maintaining good hygiene practices, um, I think are all some of the really key um, attributes that are a part of any good program for uh, uh, COVID-19 protections. One of the things that uh, Amron is, you know, since like many of the folks on the call, I'm sure, we're part of a critical infrastructure and we've got critical operations that have to stay on a line and have to continue. So, um, uh, you know, we have certain coworkers in our organization that have continued to, to work, you know, through the whole pandemic. So we had to, uh, to act very quickly and, um, you know, really adjust on the, on the move in many cases to make sure that we kept everyone safe while we're also powering the quality of life for all of our customers. So um, many of our coworkers have, you know, they've been consistently um, 
you know, on the front lines through this. So health screening was actually something that uh, really early on was something that was adopted in the pandemic uh, as a way to, to help assure that we were, you know, protecting our, our coworkers as well as our, as well as our customers. So um, one of the things that we, that we have done as a mitigation strategy, in addition to, to what I have listed there, is we've, we've divided our work groups into pods. So um, smaller, we try to minimize the number of people that are together. And um, in doing that, um, we have people that are, you know, maybe reporting to locations that are not normally their, their normal show up location because they're, they're congregating in smaller groups. So one of the things that was really necessary for us to be able to accomplish that since we're spreading out this workforce um, across, you know, a, a larger geographical footprint is we needed to figure out how are we going to be able to health screen properly for that. Um, so one of the things we did is we implemented the home health screening process. So uh, this allows coworkers to use a set of questions um, and essentially they can do their, their, entire, their entire health screening from home before they would show up to either a work location or if they're coming into an actual facility, um, they can actually conduct that screening beforehand. So one, it helps with logistics, but also it helps with uh, just mitigation of risk. I mean, if, if somebody's exhibiting any of these signs and symptoms, of course, we want them to take care of that at home or uh, make phone calls, et cetera, and, and not show up to someplace where other people are. So this helps us mitigate risk and also helps us to address some of the logistics uh, challenges from a, a workforce that's distributed around. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that if we have any yes questions or any yes answers, I should say, to any of these questions, uh, you know, we wanted to be very clear to people, don't show up to work um, and, you know, make some phone calls uh, to your healthcare provider as well as your supervisor to let them know what's going on. And one of the things that we, um, that we learned and, and that we've, um, I, th I think we're doing a pretty decent job with is uh, trying to educate not only our coworkers but our supervisors as well as how to handle these things. So we do have um, additional information that our supervisors have that they can use to uh, answer questions that a coworker might have if if they answer yes to one of these screening questions. Um, some of those examples are, you know, where can I get follow-up testing if I need to? Um, where can I get additional information? Um, we also have some um, some Q and A help around, um, you know, if it says if they have questions about one of the questions on the forms, uh, we've we've captured some of those common things and provided that to supervisors for assistance. So we could go to the next slide. Thanks. So in addition to the home screening, um, we have a number of facilities that we also have. Um, screening processes set up. Actually, all of our physical locations have a health screening process uh, and capability stood up at those locations. And that's, that's for people that um, maybe have, maybe, they're, maybe the thermometer didn't work, maybe they don't have one. Um, they, we have these supplies available at the facility so that, uh, you know, the first stop is what we say in the training. The first stop that you're going to make if you were not able to perform your home health screening, your first stop is going to be at the uh, facility screening location. Um, so that that's one reason we have it there. We also have it there so that people can do a screening throughout the day if they have a need, um, or in some cases we have um, expectations that that occur. Um, in addition to the home screening, we also have some facilities that that have a requirement. So even if you screen at home, and we we want you to start from there. Um, you're going to get screened again when you get to certain facilities. Um, some of these are they're based on critical need or critical infrastructure. Um, it's just an added layer of uh, of, of screening and, and check just to make sure that um, nothing got missed or if, if something happened to develop on the commute or whatever. We just we want to do everything we can to uh, make sure we mitigate as much risk as we can. So. Um, some of those locations have an actual screening process that occurs on site. And that looks a little bit different depending on the size and complexity of the organization. Um, some of them um, have automated screeners uh, and uh, temperature check, you know, tools. Others use people um, in, a, in a more traditional screener process. 
Um, but in, in any regard, there still is another screening um, process and mechanism that happens before people are allowed to enter into some of our facilities. As you can see, this is in the photographs, this is just an example of what you know a screening location might look like. Um, this one, this particular one is set up to be a, a self-serve. Uh, this particular location is more of a self-serve. So we have everything out there to uh, to do it, all the instructions on how to perform it, what questions to ask yourself. Um, if you need uh, face coverings or anything like that, if you, if you don't have one with you or forgot yours or it's gotten damaged in some way, whatever, all those materials are available at this location. Um, we have the signage, all the sanitation materials, as well as contact numbers if somebody has a question or a concern. Um, and then all the, the trash facilities, all those sorts of things that, you know, just general maintenance or uh, logistics, I guess, to, to pull something like this together. All of those things are, are in a, uh, a standard package that, we, uh, that we've issued out to all of our facilities so that every location is able to set one of these things up in a standard way with standard uh, language, signage, protocols, all of that. I didn't mention earlier, but all of these things that I'm discussing are in a, uh, in a written document that is available to all of our coworkers as well as supervisors and anybody who might be leading people. Um, and then we also have a, uh, a training that everybody has to go through that goes through all of these things that I'm describing as well um, as more details uh, in addition to, the, to what we're talking about now. Um, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. So one of the things that, um, you know, I, I think probably most everybody on this call's experience is COVID continues to evolve. Um, what we learn uh, from, from research, from just uh, the medical community, uh, technologies have evolved. Um, I think we're just, you know, we're continuing to learn just, just like we're doing today uh, on these webinar series, uh, trying to share uh, ideas and, and how-tos with folks and, and each other. One of the things that um, that we've done over time, again, depending on the, the operation and complexity of, of, of the operation size, uh, is, and that is to uh, incorporate technologies. Um, we have our, our traditional screening setup uh, has a, a touch, touchless thermometer that, that's handheld that you can either use on yourself or that, um, you know, another coworker Who's, who's serving as a screener might use. Um, that's kind of our traditional, and that, that's how we started out. Um, as time has gone on, uh, we have um, started using other technologies. And this, this slide is really just an example of, of a couple of those uh, varieties. So in some groups, we have um, the more fixed uh, scanning gates, if you will, that kind of look like what you would walk through at a security checkpoint or something. Um, it's a very quick uh, process. You pretty much walk right through the scanner, and uh, it, it takes temperature and then gives um, an audible, you know, cue one way or another. Um, it, like I said, it moves quickly. You can move a lot of people through these. So in large facilities where, um, you know, you've got people coming in maybe through shifts or something like that, um, these, these type of setups allow you to, to do a lot of temperature checks. It also is a good um, solution if you've got maybe uh, contingent workforces, uh, contractors, supplemental personnel, things like that. Um, this is another uh, tool that just helps manage uh, temperature checks in a high volume situation. And it also is a way to increase, if you're thinking about the hierarchy of controls, you know, you're, you're putting more space and distance between, you know, you don't have to have a temperature screener here to do this. Uh, so it's just, just another way to, to make things more efficient as well as uh, help mitigate risk. The, uh, the picture to the right on your screen, the portable scan, it's another um, you know, techno piece of technology, temperature screens. Uh, this one is more portable. Uh, you can move this, this around very easily. Um, it has uh, good accuracy and um, it's, it's pretty simple, straightforward piece of material or a uh, piece of equipment to use. Um, a lot of the operations like this because it is portable, they can move it around. Um, and it, it's like the other tool, it is, uh, you know, essentially you, you don't have to have a, a person necessarily standing right with somebody doing screening. You can separate people. Um, and and it's, uh, it's just a good, 
good use of technology. So if we could go to the next um, slide. So uh, one of the things that, that uh, like, like we have with many of the, the COVID um, aspects is we, we've learned things along the way. And, and I just wanted to share some of those things um, with everybody on the call today um, and, and try to dive into these a little bit. But so, you know, one of the things that we've, we've been able to do is leverage uh, medical professionals. So our screening questionnaires, um, a lot of our protocols, whether it's health training or, um, you know, some of the other protocols that we've used for uh, COVID-19 protections, we've been able to, uh, to use uh, medical professionals to help us with that. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that I think has helped us tremendously um, is, is having access to that. In our particular case, um, we actually have uh, somebody that's helping us out from a consulting uh, standpoint, um, but I would encourage you know any any uh, medical um, expertise that you can that you can lean uh, lean on in these situations uh, to help answer questions or to bounce things off of. Uh, it's just been hugely beneficial um, to do so. Uh, of course, uh, legal and HR requirements, you want to be sure uh, when you're setting up these things, there's privacy issues that need to be addressed and you need to be careful of uh, with health screening. Um, you want to be, of course, very protective of people's privacy and uh, and be res very respectful. Also, you want to be very transparent with people um, so that they feel comfortable with how this data and information is used. Um, I, I actually showed some, some uh, forms in, in the, uh, the presentation earlier on the earlier slides. Those are just really visual cues. We don't maintain, we don't have people filling out records and turning those in and we're, we're not keeping uh, track of, you know, thousands of records. Um, if we do have somebody that um, does have one that uh, answers yes or has a fever or something like that, we do maintain those documents in a private um, confidential file, uh, just as a matter of record. But uh, for everybody else that's just coming through the doors, that's we don't maintain any records on those to help um, to help just make sure that we don't have any concerns with those things. Plus, it saves on thousands and thousands of records that would be created. Um, supply chain. This one's really important. You know, I think availability of products, um, just all the logistics that goes into setting these things up, uh, making sure that you know face covers, gloves, sanitation material, trash, just all the things that has to be. Uh, thought about when you're setting these things up uh, to make them work efficiently, um, as well as the products, you know, like uh, thermometers. You know, early on, we had a very difficult time obtaining enough thermometers to be able to, to stand this up. So it took a lot of hard work on our supply chain uh, side. Um, testing, you know, you want to make sure if you're going to be using technologies, uh, accuracy is very important, calibration, things like that. You want to be real thoughtful and cautious about testing and before you deploy any new technologies on a large scale or even on a small scale, just you want to really test them out, make sure that they're working and giving you the results that you're looking for that you can trust. And then partnership, whether that's with coworkers, facilities, operations, um, you know, transparency um, with leadership and coworkers, bargaining units, all of these things, it's important to have really strong partnerships in uh, whether it's supply chain or, or really any of these groups. Coworker education, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we have CBTs around this as well as uh, reminders and uh, ongoing communication and education as part of COVID-19 um, protocols as well as the health screening. Um, you know, any special considerations to outages? Uh, we, we have outages where we do maintenance on our plants uh, that, that require large contingent workforces and uh, contractors, supplemental personnel, et cetera. You really need to be thinking about how you're going to manage that and how um, you know how to how to again communicate very clearly with your uh, contingent workforces and, and contractors so that everybody's on the same page. You want to make sure that everybody um, understands what the expectations are. Um, and in our case, you know, we, we make sure that everybody that comes on the site and onto one of our sites um, is going through a health screening process um, all the same. Um, and then the last thing I think there was a, a key for us is uh, multiple versions of the same process. So uh, we, we were able to scale up and down depending on the size and complexity of our operations. Um, like I said earlier, some, some are using technologies, 
for others, it doesn't make sense to to have that kind of investment. So really being able to scale these, uh, maybe the how the, the how this is completed um, is important, um, but you want to be following a very consistent process. So whether we're using technologies or not, the processes that we use, how we manage records, the communications, all of those things are standard. So um, those are just some of the, the key lessons learned that, that I wanted to share today. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Emily, and um, I'll take a look at the, uh, the chat and see if there's any questions. So um, thank you for your time and attention. Back to you, Emily. Thank you, Jason. That was really helpful. There um, are quite a few questions in here. It looks like um, specifically the uh, temperature gate um, caught a, the attention of a few people. Uh, so thank you for that. As we close out um, our webinar here, I just wanted to share some of the resources that are available on the website. Uh, there are a lot of resources on there, and I know it can be a little bit heavy to navigate. Um, on the screen we're looking at, the one I want to point out is the Safer Playbook. That's where you can find that overarching framework that I talked about in the beginning of the webinar, um, as well as the uh, Playbook Deeper Dive documents that look at the six topic areas in the four operations type. On the left-hand side here, organizational vulnerability assessment, uh, this is a new item that the council just pushed out. I, I think last week was um, the first time we had it up there. Uh, Morgan, if you want to flip over, I grabbed a screenshot of what uh, the assessment looks like. This is a free tool that helps really tailor that laundry list of recommendations in the framework to what um, really should be on your radar. So you're gonna answer some questions about your operations uh, and upon completion, you're gonna get an organizational vulnerability risk score. You'll get a list of potential control measures that you may still need to implement and you'll get a control implementation completion summary by risk factor. So this is a free assessment tool. It'll help you look through those recommendations without being overwhelmed by the sheer number of them. So go ahead and check this out. If we wanna go back to the, the website, I wanna point out a few more of the really great items on here. Up on the top left, the Safer Solutions Directory. This is also a new item and this is, um, providers that are offering products and services that can help um, employers during this pandemic. The top middle here, the Safer Collection, these are all the resources and content that have been donated from task force members and other organizations. Uh, it's a searchable library of content. So if you had not had a chance to look through those, we're posting new stuff every day. You can look at the most popular searches. You can search by key term. Um, it's a really great library of searchable content um, in relation to COVID risk mitigation. Uh, the Take Action and Quick Hits, that's where you can find all the uh, Quick Hit items we talked about today in that top right that says Take Action. Um, in the middle series here, we have some posters available for you all. We have some other member-only, member-exclusive benefit resources for you that have been put together uh, by our membership team. So if you haven't had a chance to see uh, what your membership gets you in regards to uh, COVID-19 risk mitigation, go ahead and check that out. The last one I want to point out is this bottom right. We have a wealth of resources on mental well-being, uh, mental health stress, um, and emotional health. This is really a, um, a topic that has been of particular interest lately um, due to the overwhelming stress that we're all feeling uh, due to this pandemic. So if you're looking for any mental health resources, uh, go ahead and check that um, employee well-being um, page out. Ton of resources on there. So I want to thank you all for joining us today and for those that were able to join us on our web other webinars this week. Uh, we will have the recordings and the slides available. Uh, if you check back on the website on Monday, all of that should be up there. The one last um, uh, thing I want to plug, a few weeks ago we did um, a webinar, uh, Safer Return. It was really successful and we wanted to bring it back for another round. So July 15th, you can join our own Catherine Mendoza and Anthony Washburn to talk about the safer framework and how you can create a plan for a safe return to full operation. Uh, if you want to find a link to that, it's also available on the website at nsc.org forward slash safer. Uh, if you have any additional questions, if we weren't able to get to your questions, um, or if you think of something later, you are welcome to either email me 
um, or Jason or the safer at nsc.org email box. So thank you all. I hope you have a fantastic weekend.